I'd like to call to order the City of Littleton City Council virtual regular meeting for Tuesday, January 19, 2021. The time is 6.30 or 18.30. City Clerk, uh, roll call, please. Mayor Valdez. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Malin. Here. Council Member Driscoll. Here. Council Member Elrod. Here. Council Member Fay. Here. Council Member Grove. Here. Council Member Milliman. Here. We have a quorum. Great. Thank you very much, Colleen. And, and uh, Colleen Norton, the city clerk, if you could also tell us how this meeting will proceed tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council, staff, citizens, and guests. I'm Colleen Norton, City Clerk, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this evening's virtual council meeting. We are streaming this meeting on cable channel 8, Facebook, and on our website, littletongov.org. Please be aware that comments left on Facebook Live will not be moderated and will not be included in the meeting minutes. Those wishing to participate in any public comment portion of the meeting are advised to view the meeting at littletongov.org backslash mylittleton Littleton 8 TV. This broadcast has the least amount of delay. The agenda will be handled by Mayor Valdez in the same way it would be handled for a regular in-person meeting. As always, citizen participation is encouraged during public comment and public hearings. There will be one opportunity for citizen participation this evening during public comment only, as we have no public hearing scheduled for tonight. To participate via phone, please call 669- 900-6833, and when prompted, enter the webinar ID 953-8897-3187. If you wish to speak during public comment, please call in early and stay on the line. Again, that number is 669-900-6833, and the webinar ID is 953-8897-3187. When public comment is announced, press star nine to raise your hand to be recognized as a speaker. Microphones will be automatically muted for all citizens calling in. Once recognized, speakers will have three minutes to address council. The clerk will announce when you have 30 seconds remaining and again when your time is up. For agenda items, Mayor Valdez will ask for a motion and a second followed by discussion and a vote. Council will vote on agenda items using a thumbs up for a yes and a thumbs down for a no vote. The clerk will call each vote with all ayes and nays. Again, if you plan on participating during public comment, please call 669-900-6833 and when prompted, enter webinar ID 953-8897-3187. Please stay on the line and press star nine to raise your hand to speak. Thank you, Mayor. Great, thank you very much, uh, Colleen Norton. Council, any changes to our agenda? Seeing none, it is approved. We'll move on down to our comments and reports. We'll start with the city manager. Uh, Mayor, no report this evening, thank you. Great, thank you. City attorney. No report, thank you. All right, we'll go down to our council members. We'll start with council member Driscoll. No report, Mayor. Council member Elrod. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the Arts and Culture Commission met last Thursday and uh, they reviewed the final draft of the strategic plan um, and it looks fantastic. The team really did a great job. We are uh, going to be ratifying it at our next meeting, but um, we'll look forward to sharing with council um, and then uh, also hopefully, uh, I believe we're talking about it at the retreat as well. So just uh, wanted to make everyone aware and, um, you know, big uh, thanks to the Arts and Culture uh, Commission, um, Kelly Nardi and her team and Tim um, Nims for pulling that together. It's a really great um, document and a big step forward for us. So that's all I have. Great, thank you very much. Council Member Fay. This Thursday evening is the District 3 Citizen Meeting. We have as of this afternoon, 51 people signed up for that Zoom call. Excellent. Um, so it starts at six o'clock and it will be this a format very similar to what we used to yep. have before. Her, the her boyfriend, they live in Phoenix now. He looks like old like me. Thank you, Keith. 
Okay. Sorry, sorry, Carl. I was wondering what was going on. The format will be very similar to what we used to do before the pandemic at the uh, Saturday morning meetings. It'll last an hour. That's it. How do people join into your meeting? They uh, go to the city website and um, um, find the, um, let's see, how to do that. Uh, the easiest probably would be to send me an email. I'll give them a link. And um, uh, Council and, Member Fay, if if I could, yes, they, please. They could also go to the city calendar for the twenty first. Oh. Click on your meeting, and it will take them right to the page where they can either register or get the information to call in. So it is on the city calendar, just like any other meeting. And it yep. will, if they click on it, it'll just take them right to your page. Beautiful. Great. Thank you, Mary, and the answer, Colleen. All right, all right. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Grove. A couple things. Um, I had the opportunity today to go on a tour of Geneva Lodge. It's a beautiful historic building, uh, very well preserved with wood inside, and it was just lovely. So um, that was kind of fun. I've never been in there. Uh, speaking of historic things, I wanted to give you a little update on uh, Historical Preservation Board. They're continuing to work on their surveys and on the preservation code, as well as the historic district, uh, based on what city council wanted. They're also working on a legacy map, uh, map of the, and it's interactive with um, the outlines, the you know old buildings that we have in Littleton, and that should be ready pretty uh, pretty quick. And so when I get the link, I'll let everybody know about that. Uh, Next Gen, they are going to meet later this week. Staff is organizing with the Transportation Board. They're going to talk about micro mobility. As you know, uh, the Next Gen has been working on that for the last couple months, and hopefully, we should see a white paper from them soon. So, they're going to send three of their members to the board and then have a joint meeting. So, that's pretty exciting. And since the Next Gen has had their sunset, clause lifted. Um, there's a couple details in their charter that needs to be updated, and they uh, will make a recommendation to uh, staff, and hopefully that'll come before council here in the next uh, few weeks. It's on a couple things that have to be taken care of. One is term limits, and they're recommending a maximum of three two-year terms for a total of six years. Uh, there was some kind of question on how old you can be when you apply and when you take um, when you actually come on since this is a board that's limited by age. And so we're looking to staff to make a recommendation on how old they have to be when they apply or when they um, actually come on uh, the board. And what do we do if they age out during their term? So we're recommending that they uh, go ahead and finish their term. So there's a couple little details that'll come uh, to council for approval in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Milliman. Um, hi, good evening. So, uh, South Metro Housing Options Board met last um, Thursday, and um, we're still very jazzed and very energized um, about uh, the corridor discussion right now with regards to the ULUC. Um, as uh, as just a little recap from last Tuesday's study session, um, there was quite a bit of um, questions and concerns that I brought to staff uh, with regards to um, the most uh, recent presentation um, and um, how housing relates to this corridor discussion. So very thankful that Ken Keys was receptive and uh, to those concerns and very much looking forward to the map that shows um, where all residential housing can be located within the quarters. Uh, so we're looking forward to receiving that. And um, also wanted to share kind of a, a heartwarming story that I saw in the, in the news online today before I got to work this morning. But South Metro Housing, uh, or excuse me, South Metro Fire and Rescue uh, rescued a black lab who inadvertently ran onto the uh, Stern Lake, which was um, completely iced over, fell into the lake. The fire department was called and they rescued the dog. And there's a video on, so it's just, it's some good news from a 
kind of a rough week. So I thought I'd share that little heartwarming story with you. That's it. Yeah, I saw that story too. I thought it was a good story. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Just real quick, uh, CDOT has now launched the first online public event for the Santa Fe Planning and Environmental Linkages Study that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. So uh, participants can log on to learn more and give feedback at cdot.gov forward slash projects forward slash Santa Fe PEL. And that's all. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. And for council, I just have that we do, and, and for our listening audience, we do have a study session following this meeting tonight. And to our city clerk, do people have to log out of this meeting and then log back into the study session meeting? Uh, no, it's one continuous meeting. If you opt to take a break between, that's um, your choice. Or you can just adjourn from the regular meeting and then start the study session. It's all okay. one webinar ID. Okay. It's likely we'll take like a one minute break in between. So mm -hmm. cool. All right. Great. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's all we have on that. We have no uh, citizen uh, appearances scheduled for tonight. So item number five, our public comments. Uh, it is, I'm going to open the public comments. It is 641. And uh, Colleen Norton, if you could please inform our audience how they can participate. Thank you, Mayor. If you wish to address City Council and you're not already in our queue, please call 669-900. 6833 and enter the webinar ID 953-8897-3187. Press star nine to raise your hand to be recognized as a speaker. Citizen microphones will be automatically muted until the citizen is called upon by the last three digits of their phone number. When called on to speak, please state your name and either your district or your address clearly for the record. Public comment is an opportunity to express opinions or to ask questions regarding issues that are not part of any public hearing on tonight's agenda. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. The city clerk will notify you when you have 30 seconds remaining and again when your time is up. City Council is not authorized under the Colorado Open Meetings Law to discuss, comment, or take action at this meeting on any issue raised by public comment that is not part of tonight's agenda. The mayor may refer the matter to the city manager or the city attorney for immediate comment after public comment or to staff to obtain additional information and report back to council as appropriate. We expect comments to be civil. Disrespectful or disruptive behavior will not be tolerated. Mayor, we currently have two callers in the queue. The caller with the last three phone number digits of 819 is first in line. Callers, please remember, if you want to speak, press star nine to raise your hand. Caller with the last uh, phone number digits of 819, please press star six to unmute yourself and begin speaking now. Hi, Council. This is Pam Chadbourne. I live in downtown Littleton. Um, a few comments. First off, thanks for taking the time every meeting and every opportunity to give the public information about how to participate. I really appreciate that. Second, I'd like to talk about the January 5th uh, meeting minutes in this packet. And I'm glad that uh, comments or information were added for uh, public commenters in the minutes. That's a good change in the right direction, but unfortunately, as when you get to the public hearing item, the records for public comment were back to the too brief statement of opposed. Um, I'm going to ask you to consider whether that's not disrespectful to public speakers. Um, and public speakers bring reasons for their requests that deserve to be a matter of record. And I believe it's inherently interesting to members of the public to understand what their peers have done during a meeting. Please add more specifics about public comments um, in the meeting minutes. Sec uh, third, tonight's first reading of proposed changes to the Littleton Englewood Wastewater Treatment Plant requirements for naturally occurring radioactive material um, remind me that I've always been asking about um, other pollutants that our plant ought to take on 
if not now, soon. One of them is collecting data on how to screen out plastics, um, specifically clothing particles, and also bioactive chemicals, which remain active in the environment and affect all sorts of life, from plants to amphibians to people. Um, so I would like to remind you that that's something that South Platte Renew staff ought to undertake as well. Last meeting you talked, or recently you talked about short-term rentals, and I want to make a comment about those. The public group that you defer to and say that you should listen to for uh, working out or advice about short-term rentals, specifically the number, the maximum number of uh, folks in a short-term rental. 30 it's seconds. not representative. At the time they were formed, there were four short-term rentals pretty much in the city. Now there are four, over 40. Those people are not representative. Um, they are, and, and you've gotten input from people who live near short-term rentals who are unhappy about them. That group is not representative. Do not take their, their recommendations as gospel. Finally, there should be no residential on corridors. And regardless of what South Metro Housing says, it doesn't help us to add housing Thank in you. dangerous places. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Colleen, if we have our next caller, please. Mayor, there is one more caller in the queue, but we have no other hands raised. Uh, if we could just take a moment. Um, Caller with the last three digits of 443. If you intend to speak, please press star nine to raise your hand. Mayor, we have no other callers in the queue with their hand raised. All right, thank you very much. And with that, I will close the public comment. It is uh, 647. Uh, city manager, do you have anything you'd like to add? Sorry, computer glitch there, just trying to unmute. Um, the question about the detail of minutes has been uh, a topic ever since I've been here for the past five years. And so what we do is a summary minutes. Uh, so I'll provide here just a summary back to council of how we approach that and why. So um, obviously we as staff, we recommend just kind of a current approach on how we do minutes. And that's the end of my comments. Thank you, uh, city attorney. Yeah, I guess just to follow what the city manager um, was speaking as to regarding the minutes. So the Littleton City Code talks about the minutes and the requirements, and it says that they're action minutes. And when it's an action minute, um, essentially that just means that we're recording what the motions were, what the vote of any motions were, uh, the names of citizens that were speaking, and their stance. So I know that the city of Littleton, indeed, a lot of um, jurisdictions have struggled with um, how expansive um, you want to be on the minutes. Uh, the fear is, is that you mischaracterize what someone was saying, or you spend that much time um, putting that information together that it makes it a little, you know, pretty unwieldy. I would say, by and large, across the city, um, city, the Denver metro area, most um, take action minutes. You know, what was the motion? What was the vote? And, and move on. So obviously that's a discussion for council if they want to change that approach. Um, and I'm sure uh, the city manager can provide maybe more of a historical background on, on how we've come to, to subscribe to uh, action minutes. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we will move on to our item number six, our consent agenda items. And city clerk, Colleen Norton, if you would please. Thank you, Mayor. Consent agenda items can be adopted by a simple motion. All ordinances must be read by title prior to a vote on the motion. Any consent agenda item may be removed at the request of a council member. Great, thank you. Uh, council member Fay, if you would please introduce the items. Ordinance 02-2021. Ordinance on first reading adding chapter 24 entitled Firearms Retailer to Title III Business Regulations. Second, uh, that's B, 
Ordinance 01-2021, an ordinance on first reading establishing changes to the existing ordinance for technologically enhanced naturally occurring radioactive material, parentheses T-E-N-O-R-M, for South Platte Renew. C, ID number 21-006, Approval of the January 5th, 2021 virtual regular meeting. Great. Thank you very much, Councilmember Faye. Uh, Council, I'm looking for a motion. Mayor, I move to approve consent agenda items A, B, and C. Great. Thank you. Second. All right. So we have a motion by Councilmember Elrod. I think that was Councilmember Milliman on the second. Uh, Council, uh, ready to vote? Let's go ahead and vote. Uh, thumbs up is to approve. A uh, thumbs down is to not approve. Ready? Vote. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no general business tonight. We have no second readings tonight. And with that, Council, we we are we will adjourn to our uh, study session meeting in about one minute. So it is uh, 6.51. So we stand adjourned. And then in one minute, we will come back to our study session. Thank you. call to order the City of Littleton City Council virtual study session for Tuesday, January 19, 2021. The time is 6.52. All council members are present. So council, tonight we have one item on our our agenda tonight. That is ID number 20-317, Judge Fellman's performance review. Uh, Per Littleton City Charter, the municipal judge is appointed for a two-year terms by uh, City Council. Judge Fellman's last review was January 2019, with his contract also being approved by Council in February 2019. Um, Council Member Driscoll and Fay were appointed by City Council uh, to the Judge Review Committee and are responsible for this process. Uh, the, the City Council Review Committee did review uh, or did receive a self-evaluation from the judge and the review committee also worked with uh, city staff for any additional items that they needed uh, or required. Um, human resources, they provided the review committee with a market analysis memo and salary recommendations. Also uh, City Council Review uh, committee recommended moving forward with the process with a 3% increase to the judge's contract. Uh, Tonight is an opportunity for Judge Feldman to share information with uh, about the Littleton Municipal Court with all council members and and council member also has council members also have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, The judge's contract will be brought back to council at our next regular meeting which will be held February 2nd, 2020. And with that, I want to thank uh, Judge Fellman for joining us tonight. 
And also, uh, Littleton does have a history of, of having a well-run court. Uh, and Judge, you, you have been instrumental in bringing our, our city court into the modern era. And, and maybe that's because of your fine computer skills that you have. And uh, so you've brought us into the modern era. And Judge Fellman, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the study session. Uh, and as I said in my evaluation, self evaluation, it, it remains a, a great honor and privilege to serve the, the citizens of my town uh, in the municipal court. It's very humbling to, to deal with the uh, needs and concerns of citizens uh, in all aspects of the judicial system, uh, victims, defendants, uh, law enforcement, uh, and, and the general public. Uh, and I have been privileged for the last eight years to, to have uh, presided over the Littleton Municipal Court. We have undergone many changes over the years. Uh, and for the most part, they've been very positive. Of course, as we've all experienced, there is a one massive negative influence, tragic influence over how we do business. Um, but as I have noted out of uh, challenges come opportunities too. And uh, even in the midst of this tragedy, we have uh, learned that we, are, we do have other ways of doing business that do serve the public well. I, I think in the last two years, the, the, the major uh, positive change in the, uh, in, the, in the court has been the hiring of Danielle Trujillo as the court administrator. Uh, she is forward-looking, dynamic, uh, off the charts smart, uh, a good team player, but a team leader also, and a great teacher. I've learned a lot from her in the uh, about year and a half that she's been with us, and uh, and I'm very proud that uh, to have been part of the the team that hired her. Uh, uh, and uh, I think she has really moved us forward, even in these uh, difficult times, uh, when we. Uh, Previous to that, of course, the city clerk had the um, responsibility of, of uh, being the court administrator. But of course, simply geographically, that was difficult too. And the city clerk had so many other responsibilities. So we didn't really have a court administrator that was able to be on site as often as might be optimal. And now we did elevate the court supervisor to the position of court administrator. Uh, not the person, because Danielle came in as the court administrator, but that has helped so much. Danielle knows the city very well, and she has uh, coordinated a lot of new initiatives for us. The major initiative that we're in right now, of course, is uh, replacing uh, the uh, clunky court management uh, computer system, uh, which uh, was uh, just failing constantly. And, and inhibiting our ability to serve the citizens. So at the beginning of this month, we went live with the new system and, uh, and we're all learning it. Danielle is teaching everyone very well and we have a talented staff, uh, two of which, two of the clerks of which were here before and, and two that Danielle hired and, uh, and, and they have really taken to the new system uh, uh, they are enthusiastic about it. They are curious about it. Um, they teach me a lot about what's going on. Uh, I've always thought that one of the best ways to, to learn something is to teach it. And they're doing a great job of that. Um, so I, I'm very enthusiastic about the court system. I'm, every day, I'm, I think I'm getting better. Uh, and uh, it's it's a challenge, but a, but a great challenge and opportunity. And I, I think ultimately we'll serve the city very well with it. We've also had to, to just as city councils had to do, 
change the way we do business and interact with the public uh, in, in terms of virtual court to a degree. People still have the option of coming into the courthouse if they wish. Uh, so we've established protocols for that. I sit in the upstairs courtroom now with one clerk and I'm linked by video with the downstairs courtroom and and the citizens who want to come into the courthouse come in through there. And, and of course, we are very careful with our uh, health protocols about that. And most people, of course, call in uh, those who have capabilities of, of attending court virtually. Uh, so it is a new way of doing business. Um, and frankly, I do miss the interaction uh, with, with citizens. Uh, in my 20 years in the county court, the most satisfying uh, part of that job was being able to interact with citizens, uh, you know, from a 10 foot distance instead of a virtual distance. Uh, and, and I think it, it was a, a very satisfying experience for me, but I, I'm finding ways to, to make this satisfying also. And, and I, hope the citizens are, are also, and I hope they feel they're being treated well. We go out of our way to, to accommodate the, their, their needs, uh, their virtual needs. Um, and we, no one is punished for the inability to appear virtually or deal with us virtually. virtually. We, uh, we accommodate everyone. I do look forward to the day when we can uh, assemble again. Uh, but uh, it, it is still very satisfying to, to have the, the court staff there to, to work with as a team. It's a great team. Our probation officer is great. Uh, even our guard is very helpful and, and attentive to everything. Uh, so it's, uh, that, that has been uh, uh, very positive. I'd also add, that uh, Reed has elevated the professionalism of the city attorney's office. I'm sure you've noticed that uh, with not only his uh, talents, but also the fact that he's made two really good lawyer hires. And uh, also the legal assistant that we have now uh, is, uh, is very talented, very smart, very diligent. The only negative I can say about her is that Reed stole her from our staff in the court clerk's office. But uh, I, I think that she is well suited to that job. Uh, but uh, you know, Ashley uh, put together some really needed changes to the city code that, that make it easier for, uh, for us to uh, address certain issues and there's more clarity on how we address them. Um, and uh, Tracy Schroeder, the prosecutor, a very experienced prosecutor uh, and a very diligent uh, and professional uh, prosecutor who's just, she's just a good person, has, uh, has really elevated the, the level of, of prosecution. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the late uh, Justice Robert Jackson, who when he opened the Nuremberg trials. He, as a Supreme Court justice, he was the chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials. In his opening statement, he, he said to the world, fairness is not weakness. And I think that is something that we can all live by. Uh, and I think uh, it, it filters through the prosecution. I hope it filters through the court, that concept that we can be fair, but that doesn't mean we're giving up our resolve to to handle cases correctly and to to assist victims care uh, properly so it's a great atmosphere the only thing missing is the humans in the courthouse and i found it all very satisfying still thank you judge uh carol uh, council member carol fay has a question for you or comment um, Yes, Judge. Pertaining to the, the last time we did a performance review with you, we mean counsel, um, two years ago, uh, you had said that in your last evaluation that you indicated one of your goals was to improve customer service. So from a pre-COVID perspective, what is one thing that you're delighted about that you've done to improve customer service? 
Well, I think for one thing, we've made it more staff intensive in terms of dealing with the public so that we're uh, just down to the simplicity of phone calls. Uh, we have made made the signage more uh, customer friendly. And of course, this is when we have customers in the courthouse. Uh, I think one thing we have also done that uh, serves a segment of our public is that our public defender now has uh, has helped us give good service to the people, some people who are really in need of service. Uh, so I, I think it's it's things along those lines. I think it's taking a look at what we're we're doing and saying, is this how we should do it? It's gotten kind of distorted, I have to say, because of the, the pandemic. And without casting aspersions on anyone, we did have a difficult beginning of 2019 because of some staff issues that were resolved when Danielle was hired. Um, and, uh, and so I think the staff is oriented towards customer service now. That's, that's the first thing we, we look at. Are we serving the public by what we're doing? Okay, thank you, Judge. Thank you, Council Member. And, and I, would, I would add, not to, not to help out the judge, but the addition of online payments was something that the judge and, and Danielle um, really pushed for over the beginning of this past year. Um, in the past, defendants would have to come in to, just to pay a simple um, ticket. So the ability for uh, customers to be able to pay online, I think, is a, a huge improvement. And I don't know, Judge, not to prime you for questions and answers, if, if you've seen an effect on the attendance, I guess, prior to COVID hitting. I'm sorry, attendance? Yeah, was the addition of online, with the addition of online payments, did it lead to a, a decrease in citizens having to appear? Absolutely. Um, we, we previously, and I, and I thank you for reminding me of that, Reed, uh, but previously we had the high tech uh, system of a drop box on the west side of the courthouse. And uh, that was somewhat helpful. Although certainly there were certain defendants who uh, saw it for use, used it for different things, uh, <laughs> but uh, but I, I do think that that people do appreciate, and we do get comments that they appreciate being able to appear virtually and make online payments and go to the website uh, and make their payments. And our clerks, uh, of course, if they need a payment schedule, we we email them uh, payment instructions to talk about how to set up a schedule for payment. Um, and, and I think that just overall attendance is, is better uh, because we're reaching people by phone and they're not uh, inhibited from appearing because of uh, uh, geographical issues, transportation issues. Uh, as I kind of alluded to in my self-evaluation, Though, uh, you know, when we talk about the domestic violence cases, uh, and we're going back and forth about what to do about those cases, because right now they're in the county court because of the COVID. But um, one, one thing that has uh, troubled me, but I think it's being accounted for in the county court, is convenience to victims uh, for coming to court. Uh, obviously, most crimes occur within like a mile and a half or so of the courthouse. And so it was easy for victims to come to court. And now they have to go, I don't know, 15 miles to, to uh, uh, Dove Valley uh, for court. But I do have confidence that the, the county court and district court uh, who have traditionally been very victim oriented uh, in, in terms of serving victims, I, I think they're doing a good job. And and we do have a, an, a victim advocate in the police department who does a great job of uh, of assisting victims in practical issues like, like that. So that's the one thing where I'd like to uh, make sure we're serving better. And, and that's one of the reasons we have the capstone project to see if we are doing it right. Thank you, Judge. Council Member Grove interested judge in the teen court and I know you can't implement it yet uh, because of COVID but 
Um, we probably won't be talking to you for a couple of years like this, so I want to hear about it. Maybe it'll be implemented. Can you tell me, as other jurisdictions have done this, who is on the court and the penalties? Do the other teens, uh, you know, make a recommendation on penalty and do you overrule it? Or if it's not what you think is appropriate, do you change it? I don't know. Just it sounds like something that's pretty innovative. Yeah, and a lot of jurisdictions have had teen court, um, and uh, our deputy presiding judge, who's also Loretta Huffine, who's also the juvenile judge, uh, has a lot of experience in teen court from her many years in Aurora Municipal Court. Um, and, I, and I've talked to judges in other jurisdictions. Some have teen court, of course, some don't. Uh, no one, there's, there's not a cookie cutter uh, style on it. Uh, but it's generally uh, that that they are judged literally by their peers. Uh, the uh, the case is presented in most places by their peers. It's ruled on by their peers. Um, if there's if they want representation, they get represented by one of their peers, and and that's not in all courts. That's in some courts, um, and. Uh, the, uh, and, and are these peers, are they people that have also been in the court system or how do they get selected? It varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, now, we have not had a teen court up and running here, but I, I think that some jurisdictions uh, sort of advertise it in the schools and say who would like to take part in teen court. Uh, some jurisdictions, when, when a, a juvenile uh, finishes their issues with court, uh, is invited to maybe become a, uh, a, a teen court juror or other participant. Um, but as I said, it, it is different in every jurisdiction um, because of the COVID. And I, I hate to keep blaming things on the COVID, but we have not been able to do it. When we hired Danielle, one of the things she was really enthusiastic about was teen court. She had set up a teen court in one of the other jurisdictions she had worked in. And so she was very familiar with it and she had definite ideas about how to do it. And she had the enthusiasm. And then uh, uh, she of course had to get her, her uh, get a lot of things straightened out in the, you know, moving in the courthouse. And as we were getting close to doing a teen court, we couldn't. Do you foresee, and again, it's not solidified yet, but is, is part of the vision to abide by what the teens recommend or do, do you feel like it might be appropriate to overrule them or not? If I were, if we had a, a teen court and I was the judge who was overseeing it, I would be very reluctant to overrule it. I would want to, want to uh, give so much deference to the to the teens who are running the court. Uh, and, and of course, the kids who would be the defendants in the teen court are not the, the hardest defenders by any means anyway. Although in some jurisdictions, they do take harder cases. But, uh, but I, I think it's good to, to give the teens the confidence in their own uh, in their own judgment. And of course they do get training and oh. get an introduction to the judicial system before they start as participants in teen court, uh, in running a teen court for themselves. It's overseen by the judge, of course, and the judge does have to step in if there's something that's gonna be a violation of someone's due process. Um, but I, I, Do only so, certain kind of cases go to teen court? It, again, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions have only the most minor things like minor in possession of alcohol, minor shoplifting cases. Uh, some uh, do uh, maybe uh, harassments at school. Uh, it, 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 there's a whole continuum that various teen courts uh, follow. Um, and I don't really have an opinion as of yet as to just how deeply we should go into offenses, how what the serious, where on the continuum of seriousness we should fall. Um, I know Judge Huffine 
uh, has some thoughts on it. And I, and I really respect her thoughts on it since she's had so much experience in it. And she's had the opportunity actually to see teen courts evolve uh, from her, I think about 30 years in Aurora Municipal Court. Um, and I think her lessons from evolution of courts, I think would be very helpful in making that determination. But there has to be prosecution input too, because ultimately the prosecution decides, the city attorney decides to what extent a case should be prosecuted and whether it should go to a teen court. And we do get recommendations from the police also as to whether that should be, or we would, I should say. Thank you for sharing. It was just something of interest. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Judge. Uh, City Attorney. Yeah, I was just going to uh, chime in and add to what the judge was stating in regard to teen court. Um, obviously, there are, it does vary by jurisdiction. I've been involved in teen court in Lakewood as well as Arvada, um, where Danielle came from in terms of the teen court there. And so um, it's, it's, you know, the, the prosecution or the defense of any person eligible for teen court is done by one of their peers. Um, and as the judge mentioned, a lot of times you get those volunteers through the schools, you know, who's interested in doing this. And they're talking to, to jurors who are also their, their peers. And many of the times what I've seen, and as judge mentioned, you know, again, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction is they're really deciding on what kind of a constructive sentence would be. Um, for this type of offense, whatever they hear in terms of what was going on that day, what happened. A lot of times it's, it's, it's fights or, or theft or things like that. Um, but it does vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But the thought behind it is that, um, you know, a teen who's generally having their first time involved in the legal system is going to care a little bit more about it um, when they're hearing it from their peers, when their peers are deciding what the sentence should be um, rather than, you know, one of us that's sitting up there that, you know, we're out of touch and, you know, we're just old and you don't know how it is, but it's different coming from um, one of their peers. Or at least uh, that's the thought process behind it. But I just thought I would add to um, what, what the judge was stating in regard to team court. Thank you. Council member Milliman. Hi, Judge Feldman. Hi, neighbor. Hi, neighbor. <laughs> so I, I wanted to commend you and thank you for all of your work um, with domestic uh, violence victims in our community. Um, I know that's a very, um, it's very difficult, but I, I commend you for everything that you've done over the years to um, support those victims. But I had a question for you about the Tri-Cities um, Homelessness Initiative. I know we have our uh, meeting coming up on uh, the end of the month, I think. And um, I know that you stated that you were very interested in what that um, study was going to, um, the data that was gonna be presented. A um, couple of questions are, um, is Arapaho County Judicial um, uh, folks, are they gonna be involved in that meeting too as well? And then what do you foresee as far as how, um, how the city court can handle what I imagine is gonna be an increase in, in homeless or unhoused um, individuals in our community due to COVID, loss of jobs, being evicted from their homes, unable to afford housing here, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not real familiar with Tri-City. Um, I know that they have not issued any, at least as far as I know, uh, they've not issued any report or recommendations as of yet, but I think council member Faye is on that. Is that correct? And, uh, and uh, is one, one other council member on that? But, uh, and I think it, it covers Littleton, Englewood, and Sheridan, I believe. Judge, Judge you're, you're right. Uh, the members from Littleton on that um, group are um, uh, Sam Fox, um, city manager, and me. And we are scheduled to give a report from that um, group this coming 
a week from this Thursday, so the 28th. That's that's on the calendar. It's the Tri-Cities Joint Council meeting that we typically have once a year, and uh, it's in the evening. And so you, uh, everybody will get a full report of the extensive work that group has done in the last almost couple of years. It's pretty big. And, 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 looking- and, and in all fairness to, to Judge uh, uh, Feldman, he has not had a role in that group at all, so we can't expect him to be able to report on what it's been doing. And, and I gather there are a lot of really smart, committed people in that group. And and I I think that they can enlighten all the municipal courts or all the three municipal courts in our, uh, in the Tri-City group. In terms of the county courts, um, I, I don't honestly know what, what they are doing, of course, the Arapahoe County Court uh, generally covers has cases from unincorporated Arapahoe County, um, and uh, they also cover Centennial. Though I mean, all ca- all cases from any of the cities and or unincorporated Arapahoe County can go to county court, but the municipalities are really the front line in issues of of uh, homelessness. Uh, so um, I think I've got a lot to learn as to what they're going to say. Homelessness is so complex that that um, I think the court system is just a small piece of it. But I think the court system has to be uh, on board with what everyone else is doing. For instance, we do partner with All Health uh, Network, and they have been great with some of the cases we've had. We've had kind of a drop of homeless defendants, though, since the COVID started. I I know that one of our most chronic offenders uh, has had his cases written into county court, however, because the county court has more resources at this point, um, the county probation system. Um, But I'm just eager to hear what what is going to come out of that. And and I, I am committed to doing whatever the court's piece of it ought to be. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll go next, and then it'll be Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Judge, uh, a two-part question. Uh, have you had a drop in your cases this past year? And if so, is it a, is it a drop in all areas, uh, or is there an increase in a drop in some and increase in others? I, I know you just mentioned homelessness has been a drop. Well, the statistics are just generally, first of all, um, our traffic, let's see, well, just overall, our, here we go, our overall, our uh, cases have dropped in 2020 uh, by two thirds, our caseload. And I would have to say that it's, at least in terms of criminal cases, misdemeanor cases like theft, harassment, et cetera. Um, those have dropped probably about at the same rate uh, as uh, um, traffic. For a while, the officers uh, were not writing as many tickets. Part of it was because there weren't very many as many people out on the, the streets. Although what I did notice, parenthetically, is that some of the speeding cases cases were more aggravated because uh, people seeing Santa Fe wide open, even more wide open than usual, uh, they would they would really be hauling it uh, down Santa Fe and on C four seventy. Um, so we we're getting more intense cases, but fewer traffic cases, and then the criminal cases went down, have gone down also uh, as, as part of that. I don't have the exact uh, distribution of that at hand, but the uh, part of the criminal cases I said is fewer homeless cases. Uh, We've had fewer shoplifting cases out of uh, King Supers at Littleton and Broadway. Uh, I think anecdotally it might be because there was a guard there, a private security guard there who was... uh, very diligent and and uh, and 
had a lot of shoplifters and uh, that has uh, declined somewhat. And I'm not criticizing the current uh, guard. I think each business has to make their own decision as to what to do with shoplifters. We have had more cases out of Home Depot uh, because of, I think because uh, there's more of a market for construction work during the, the pandemic. People are, are doing more renovation and hence more people are taking things. Uh, uh, and of course, domestic violence cases are non-existent. Ah, well, good, that's good. We have Mayor Pro Tem and then Council Member Elrod. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Judge Feldman, um, for coming here tonight. I know it's not an easy thing to be evaluated, um, and I appreciated your, your thoughtful self-evaluation as well. Um, I, I have a question, but I'll just start with my evaluation uh, as one council member, which is that uh, I, I believe Judge Feldman has uh, an outstanding legal and judicial resume. Uh, he has very deep roots in Middleton, having lived here for now, I think, almost 40 years. Um, and uh, he has um, wonderful abilities uh, as a judge in terms of his fairness, uh, his communication skills, um, and so on. You know, I, I, I echo what so many in our community have said before me that we're very uh, lucky to have him. Uh, I, I really believe that. My... Uh, my question, Judge, is that um, you know one of the one of the uh, topics, one of the issues that that came very much to the fore in 2020 is the interaction uh, of race with criminal justice systems. And um, you know, we had an opportunity as counsel to talk with our police department about that. And of course, there's always room for improvement. But I think as a city, we have a very positive story to tell there as far as officers receiving implicit bias training and so on. Um, what is our municipal court proactively doing uh, to make sure that um, you know justice in Middleton is administered equitably, uh, regardless of someone's race uh, or ethnicity? Well, I, I think that, well, first of all, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, for your kind comments. I appreciate that very much. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's kind of hard to be actually proactive with, in terms of, first of all, what cases come to us because the police determine what cases come to us. Um, and then of course, the, our mission is to treat everyone equally uh, and treat all cases based on the, the facts, the evidence, the law, and, and then look at cases individually and to a great degree, it, it does start with the police and then the prosecution makes prosecution decisions uh, in, on uh, how each case is to proceed in terms of plea agreements or whether a case goes to trial. The, the court's function uh, is if there's a contested case to make a determination of whether the prosecution has proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt and if a case is proven at trial, or if it's based on a plea bargain, uh, the court, of course, the judge has to determine what the appropriate sentence is. Um, so I personally have not noticed any theme from the police department uh, in terms of uh, anything that smacks of bias, explicit or implicit. Um, it looks to me like they're they're out there uh, doing their job. They're reacting to citizen complaints. They're being proactive in some of their policing, but I haven't seen anything that that to me indicates any bias. And then the cases come through the prosecution office, and uh, again, I have not noticed any uh, any implicit or explicit bias. And in fact, the uh, I think that our current prosecutor and, and our previous prosecutors also have have been very diligent in in and thoughtful about uh, how, how cases are handled, regardless of of uh, race or ethnicity. Uh, 
prosecutor is quite sensitive also to uh, to uh, the financial aspect of demographics too and and understanding how some people wind up in the court system and and I like to think I understand too how some people do and try to tailor the consequences to um, to what their situation is um, you know one of the one of the aspects of our current virtual court is that almost everybody appears by phone and not by uh, by a, a video also and and so uh, you know I don't know what their ethnicity is necessarily obviously some names have uh, a uh, uh, an ethnic origin in all likelihood but I don't see people uh, and I I purposely uh, avoid looking at the race uh, box on tickets I, I don't want to know that. Uh, obviously, if someone appears in front of me, I know that. But, but to me, it's uh, it just boils down to being very attentive to our our duty, which is to look at the law, look at the facts, uh, and uh, take into account input from prosecution, from victims, and then try to make a fair decision. Um, I, I don't think anyone can really say that, that, that they're able to fully set aside, uh, when you come in contact with someone, uh, their ethnicity, uh, but I hope it's not a factor. Uh, we all are who we are and, um, and proudly so in, in most cases, I would think. Um, but, uh, again, it, it's, it's all part of judging, which is, you just try to be, try to be fair. Um, uh, I do think that there are some people who would be concerned that there's no one that looks like them in the courthouse, uh, uh, at times so they don't see people, they don't see the people who may look like them. Um, so, uh. I think that's something we, we can work on. I think we have a more diverse court staff than we did a few years ago. Uh, and I think that uh, that's, there's always room for improvement. Great, anything Thank else? You, Great. No, thanks, Mayor. Great. Thank you, uh, Council Member Elrod. And then uh, Council Member Driscoll, if you have anything, you could be up next. Hi, Judge, um, and thank you for being here this evening, and thank you as well for just um, great um, commitment and service to our community for so many years. Um, so I really appreciated your comment of, you know, a silver lining to this pandemic and some of the ways you've been able to respond. You talked about um, participation has been um, significantly higher in the case of um, these virtual proceedings, in part because we eliminate the maybe obstacle of um, transportation or otherwise. What do you see, are you, uh, what are your plans on what you will continue to do, um, you know, based on kind of some of these new um, protocols that you have now, even post pandemic? And that's something that, uh Danielle and I and the staff have talked about a lot. Um, and what, what I think we've done is uh, mainly Danielle and the staff is build an infrastructure for a new way of doing business, even after the pandemic, hopefully soon is, is over, uh, which will, I, I hope, leave people with options. I think we're learning that there are a lot of cases where people don't have to drop what they're doing and, and come to court. Um, the, uh, the sun does not, uh, rotate around the courts. Uh, we're not the center of the universe. Uh, people have lives beyond that. Although I would have to say that for most people, a court case is among the most important things in their life at that time. However, uh, I think it is really 
uh, good that we do alter, offer alternate ways of resolving their cases, automatic plea bargains, which we started even before we did the uh, um, the new court system, the new management system. Uh, and of course, that's mainly in the traffic arena. And the uh, we still do have the discretion to have people come to court and Officers have the discretion if they think a case is serious enough, even if it on paper looks like a plea bargain, to have people come to court. We still have juveniles come to court on traffic tickets and on their charges, um, if, even if they're not traffic. Um, but um, but I think we can cut down uh, on certain cases to... Uh, cut down court appearances, make it more convenient for people uh, without uh, denigrating the uh, the need for consequences. Um, it's, it's a balance, but, uh, but I think we're working towards achieving that balance. And, and we're learning right now with most people not actually coming to court, what is working and what is not working. Uh, for instance, uh, when we have a case that's serious enough where a person has to be put on supervised probation, the probation officer is listening in on the virtual proceeding. And, and when we, if the person pleads guilty or is found guilty and it's recommended they get supervised probation, the probation officer jumps right in with some uh, initial instructions so people know immediately what, they're, what they have to do. Um, instead of having to wait for an appointment with the probation officer like we we might have had to do before. Um, so I, I guess in summary, we have the infrastructure to do things differently, but I also think that there's some cases that are meaningful enough that they need to come to court, um, especially the juvenile cases, although it would be nice if coming to court meant coming to teen court for a lot of the cases. But for one reason, one reason we have the juveniles come to court on their traffic tickets is so that uh, just like uh, writing excuse notes in school, uh, please excuse Johnny from school, signed my mother. Uh, and uh, They can't say, uh, oh, yeah, my, I'm sending in this ticket. My parents approved. We, we make sure the parents know that the child got the ticket. Uh, I have a 16 year old, so please continue to do that just in case. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, Councilmember Driscoll. I'll just thank uh, Judge Feldman for all your ser your service. You know, we we've, uh, we've uh, I've been involved in this process in the past, and I really appreciate uh, what you do for the city and and how you handle uh, the citizens. Uh, very very fair and equitable. So thank you for your service. Thank you. Right, thank much. you. All right. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll just take the last shot here. Uh, Judge, I, I too want to thank you for everything you've done for us. Our, our courts have always been uh, fine courts in Littleton. They haven't always been so smooth. We've had some hiccups along the, along the road, but I think you have, have really uh, made Littleton a better city for the court that you operate. And, and thank you to, to your court administrator, Danielle, as well. You, know, you, you both are doing an incredible job for our city. So thank you very much. Council, any last uh, parting comments? If not, Judge, thank you so much for coming in. We really appreciate it. And Council will be uh, looking at the uh, the contract here in another couple of weeks. And I'd like to thank Council for years and years of support of the court and of me personally. And the Council is, all Councils have made a great city here that's really enriched the life, my life and my family's life. So I'm very grateful. And you are a member of our community, and we, we all see you out and about from time to time. So it's it's not like you're just uh, some judge that comes in and leaves. But you're, you're, this is your community. I've lived in the same house for 40 years now. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Judge. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll let you go with that. Okay. Thank uh, counsel, you uh, that, that's it for that section. Thank you very much. Uh, we're down to our last part, which is uh, administrative updates. Uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to the city manager. Uh, Mayor, I have no updates for this evening. Uh, thank you. And the city attorney has no excuse for his time being used up then. Um, I don't have any updates, but I would, you know, from the city attorney's standpoint, from the prosecution standpoint, you know, I would just let council know that uh, 
prosecution staff really enjoys working with Judge Feldman. Um, everything that counsel gets a sense for his fairness, his equitableness, you know, it's not a show. That's how he is in court and very easy to work with. And Danielle and his staff has done such a great job. Um, well, Danielle and her staff with the judge and the other judges have done such a, a great job in, in being adaptable during COVID. It has not been easy to try to juggle all these new things and to implement kind of new technology. One of the things um, that hasn't been mentioned is currently right now, uh, the court is going through a complete new filing system, an electronic type system in terms of how this is going to, how this information is conveyed to the prosecution and, and vice versa so that everyone's working on the same thing. So a lot of technological changes have been going on. And, um, you know, just from the city attorney's perspective, you know, I can't be thankful enough for for having kind of a partner in this to, to work with and Judge Feldman. So my thanks to him. No other comments. Thank you very much. And with that, counsel, if you haven't had an opportunity to take the, the mini tour of our public works facilities, as well as as uh, the Geneva Village campus, uh, uh, please, uh, if you can, find time to do that. Uh, and with that, uh, counsel, it is 741 and we stand adjourned. Thank you very much. Have a good night.